Hello everyone and welcome. Today I want to share with you a bit of a challenge. So when I was at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, they had a wonderful collection of antique garments. One thing in particular that I really loved was this coat from the 1900s. And it had all of this top stitching and beautiful work done on the lapel. And I just loved this overcoat. However, I didn't have the opportunity while I was there to actually take pattern off of it or details or much more than a few photographs. And I've always kind of regretted that. So recently when a very similar antique came up for sale from Witchy Vintage, I jumped on that and figured I would reproduce it and get all the details I needed off of this garment. However, when it came in, there was one small problem, specifically a small problem, meaning that though it was proportioned correctly, it was a 34 inch bust, which wouldn't be a huge adjustment if it was a fitted garment, but because it is a large overcoat, and I don't honestly even know how much bigger it's supposed to be than the person, that means that's gonna have to just up a lot. So that seemed a bit more than I could do with just slashing and spreading and readjusting and sizing up the pattern that I took off of the original because I don't know how much bigger it needs to be. I don't know how it's supposed to fit. I don't know if perhaps this was made more for a younger style of body that I'm gonna have to change proportions on things or like, well, I don't know. So I wanted to approach it from a slightly different angle than I would normally do for slight adjustments to patterns. Meaning I actually decided to first off do some research as to exactly what years the garment came from. That particular style of coat, I found lots of examples right around 1906, 1907. By the time you reach 1908, the sleeves start to not get bigger from the top, but get longer underneath. So think of the jacket that I made back in November, that very large sort of voluminous overall sleeve with sometimes off the shoulder or at least very dropped in the arm side. And that wasn't this style of coat. This style of coat had a little bit of fullness in the sleeve top, but not an excessive amount. It's a very practical style. It may be for a teenager in terms of the sizing, but the styles of coat, even for children versus adults, there's not a huge difference in overall styling. And the fact that this had so much detail on it, and that was the one thing I kept finding with children's coats, they might have some detail, but they'll leave off the buttons or they'll leave off some of the extra trim because there's just not space for it. This has all of the detail, <laughs> so much, so much top stitching. And I wanted to make sure that I got those proportions correct. So once I knew the year, I then went and found a tailoring manual from around the same time. Now I have noticed that tailoring manuals can be a year or two behind just because of the time it takes to get things drafted and published and all of that. So I was looking right around that 1906 to 1908 time period and I found the perfect tailoring manual on my list which is from 1908 and it gives the specifics not only of how to draft a similar overcoat but it uses the absolute perfect system meaning that it starts us off with basically drafting a body block for the era and everything sort of adjusts on that. So once I'm sure this body block fits me, it's really easy to make the rest of the stuff in that drafting manual. But like I said, the next thing in the book, the very first page was an overcoat of the exact same cut and general style. So it was so easy for me to take that knowledge and that information and go from there. Now, there was a lot of adjustments that I had to make but that's sort of the fun part. And that's what I get to show you, not only what the pattern off of the original looks like, but how I managed to adjust it up to fit me, which was a whole 10 inches bigger around the bust than the original garment. And then we can also look at the actual construction techniques and the miles and miles and miles of top stitching and how the whole thing just comes together in the end. The first step of course, was to get a pattern off of the original coat. That really wasn't the complicated part. The complicated part is figuring out how to actually adjust this pattern because like I said, I don't know how much bigger it's supposed to be than me. I don't know what I need to size up. It's not like adding a quarter inch or a half inch here or there, which won't make a great deal of effect on the overall pattern. I'm gonna have to add a lot. So I'm starting with that base draft that I talked about. The book has you make up a basic body draft and then from there you'll make adjustments like the length of the shoulders or the overall placement of the seams and the width. So I started with that base 
and went and found a coat in the book that was very similar and used that simply to adjust the side seams. It didn't have me make any major adjustments to the front line or to the shoulder seams or to any other major part of the upper body. It was mostly just adding in larger amounts at the side seam and then extending the side seam from there. So that allowed me to know how much bigger that book thought I needed to make the coat than my actual bust size. So then I was able to take that basic body block with the shoulder and the neck shape that I need, lay it down on top of the pattern I pulled off of the original and redraw it essentially. On one axis, I lined up the body block with the center front line. On the other, I lined up the lowest part of the arm side. I knew that there was a good chance I was going to have to add some length to the bottom of this coat in order to keep it proportional, but because it's not fitted at all, I didn't feel like I needed to make drastic adjustments to the actual body portion of the coat, other than simply making it bigger. Most of the fitting, therefore, is up in that shoulder area, and so I wanted to make sure that I had enough space around the arm side, enough space on the shoulders and the neck, that it would fit me properly, and that was really where the adjustment needed to happen. So those were the two points that I lined up on not only the front, but also on the back, lining up the center back seam and lining it up at the lowest point of the armpit, as it were. I did have to account for the fact that the side seam is not in the same place on the draft as it is on the original. There's also a dart in the front of the original, so there are going to be some adjustments needed for proportions and how big that sort of side piece needs to be and where the side seam actually should sit, I realized that I was going to have to add a total of five inches per side. So I decided because the front is bigger than the back piece to add more of that to the front than the back. It wasn't a drastic difference. I think I added two inches to the back and three inches to the front total which in doing that placed that side seam about where I thought it should be proportionally with a fairly similar appearance in terms of both the back and the front shape as to where it sat on that curve of the arm side. When it came to redrawing the neckline and the lapel area, I found that the place where the shoulder seam and the neck seam matched up was pretty much vertically straight up from the original. So I didn't have to make drastic adjustments to the overall neck size and lapel size, which is good because even though I'm definitely larger than this pattern, my neck isn't going to be drastically bigger. So I don't want to add a ton of space there and have it be really loose around my neckline. And so you can see the adjustments that were made of the original versus the new version. The sleeves were also sized up. What I chose to do with those was rather than adjust by, I have five inches to adjust up per side, I went and looked at the proportions because the sleeves are eased in. So I went and did the math as to how large the original sleeves and how large the original armhole was and the proportions between those. And I applied that to my armhole size and sized up my sleeves to be the same proportional difference. Then we moved into actually trying a mock-up. The only thing I found of note was that the front line of the lapel and collar area was a little gappy, which may be an issue of the shoulder angle, but it may also be an issue of the fact that this is meant to be for the era of the Gibson girl and the pigeon breast. So that should fill out. And I realized that will probably fill out with a scarf in this coat. So I'm not too worried about it at the moment. I also found that the armhole was a little bit snug. So I clipped that down on one side just to test that out. The first major thing to really tackle were the pockets. Now, the pockets on the original are a very small patch pocket. I was excited that, yay, there are pockets, but I realized that that tiny little patch pocket is all that there is. There's nothing you can fit in there. Maybe, maybe a wallet. So I realized though I was going to be sizing up these patch pockets just a little bit, they weren't going to hold enough stuff for me. I am definitely one of those people that really likes to utilize the pockets in my coats instead of carrying a purse around in the winter. So they need to be able to fit my gloves and my cell phone and my wallet, my keys and all of the things that I carry with me whenever I go out. So with that in mind, I didn't want to change the overall proportions and size of the patch pockets. I felt like that might just look a little weird. So I decided instead to sort of make a hidden pocket. So not only is there the regular patch pocket done up in the same way as the original, but I 
actually put a slit in the coat fabric and then stitched a pocket bag in behind that. So there is now a hidden pocket inside of both of my pockets, which is large enough to fit everything that I need. One of the key factors of this coat repeatedly throughout is all of the top stitching. This is done not only on all of the edges, but also on every single seam as well. The front darts are done with a little piece of canvas behind them as a way to interface where there is not enough seam allowance. But the back seams and the side seams have enough seam allowance, so it's just done with multiple lines of top stitching on either side of the open seam, which use the seam allowance as a reinforcement. This top stitching will become the theme of the entire rest of this video. The collar has the same typical top stitching design used as a machine version of pad stitching for the under collar. It does have an interfacing inside of it, which is a fairly stiff canvas. This is the same canvas that is used not only for the strip that runs down the dart, but also at the base of the sleeves for the top stitching design that is done there. There is a second type of canvas that was used in this coat, which is just for that front section. It's a little bit lighter weight and softer. The coat itself is in fairly decent condition. It has a lot of little moth holes and some other wear and tear. The lining, however, is pretty well dead. In fact, the entire sleeve linings are gone. So I can see inside and see where the canvases are, see where the reinforcements are. I can peek just inside of that collar a little bit and see what sort of canvas was used in the original, which means that though the original is not in great condition for that reason, I can at least see all the things that I need to see. And so that works out great for me. Along with the pockets on the outside, there is one small pocket on the inside, and I need to emphasize the small part. Not only is the actual opening of the pocket very tiny because it needs to fit within that wool facing, it is also a very, very tiny pocket bag. I was kind of excited when I saw that there was an interior pocket because I figured maybe that's where she would put her gloves or the things she needed to carry, but in reality, it's maybe, maybe big enough for a watch. That's it, it is so tiny. So I ended up adjusting the placement and the angle of this pocket just a little bit on my version. So that way I could manage to put in a slightly larger pocket bag. One of the difficulties here is that I don't want the pocket bag to extend really far outside of the facing area and go underneath the lining. It would still be hidden, but it kind of gets into a difficult area with stitching those things together. So I try to aim it more downwards and have it follow along with the line of the facing. By adjusting that angle of the opening, I managed to still be able to get my hand into it easily when the coat is on, and I have enough pocket space to actually be able to fit something like a wallet or a cell phone in that area. I do want to note that the welting on this pocket was a little bit unusual to me. I've never done a welted pocket this way, but I kind of like it when it comes to doing it for a wool broadcloth, which has edges that don't ravel and therefore don't really need to be finished off. When it came to all of the fancy stitching on the lapel, it was really the hardest part for me to brain out of the whole coat because it really required me to look at the original and figure out exactly what step needed to occur in what order. Because some of the stitching wasn't done through the entire coat. The silk that is stitched onto the front doesn't go through any layers other than just that facing layer. It can't go through the rest of the body of the coat or it would be visible. However, all of the edge stitching and the decorative piece that's applied to cover up the edges of the silk piece are done after the facing is assembled. I also found that the edges going around the entire exterior of the hem and the vents in the back are all done at the same time as stitching around the facing. So all of the little pieces that needed to be added as sort of tiny facings in order to finish off the edges really nicely are stitched down at the same time. So I went ahead and pinned and basted all of those things into place and then top stitched around all of the edges at one time.
briefly mentioned earlier that the sleeves are fairly full in comparison to the actual armhole. However, there's not really big gathers or pleats like some of the other jacket styles of this era. Instead, because this is a really good wool, and especially in the case of a broadcloth, there's a lot of shaping that can be done. So the sleeve head is actually gathered in and then steamed and pressed so that way the gathers sort of disappear. It's really easy to adjust your wool either by stretching or by drawing it in this way. So I can get a very nice curved full sleeve head without having wrinkles and gathers in that area. They 
also put in a good deal of reinforcement and extra fullness in the sleeve head. Not only do they put in a tailor's tape to make sure that it doesn't stretch out over time, but they also put in a lot of cotton wadding. Now, I didn't happen to have cotton wadding in my house and it wasn't worth it to me to go out into the wild world at this moment and find it. So I just used the polyester batting that I had, which is going to be the same effect, though it is unfortunately polyester. But they just simply cut strips, rolled them in half, and stitched those by hand to the interior side of the sleeve head, which will help sort of fill out that extra space and make sure that that very voluminous sleeve head does not deflate. Though this is a much larger version than I'm used to doing, it is the same thing that is done in nicely made men's suits. 